first of all, let's note down what we have and what our goal is. So what we have, as I said, is, let's call it A, a finite dimensional simple Q algebra and what we also have is O which is an order in A. What does it mean for O to be an order in A? Well, it means basically two things. First of all, we want that O is a subring of A. And what we also want is that O simultaneously is a lattice in L. Uh, in A, I'm sorry. All right, so this is what we've got, and our goal is to compute the unit group of O. And let me first talk shortly about what the plan for the next roughly 40 minutes is. Um, first, I'd like to remind us of parts of the notation that Renaud Colangeon used during his talks and what we can obtain when applying Voronoi theory. Afterwards, we're going to briefly talk about um, modifications that we need to make to our notation and the notions of minimality and things like that in order for us to be able to use it in the extension case. Then we are going to talk about how our unit group of this order um, acts on our forms, um, which is basically going to give us the, um, about what we need so that we can apply Bastet theory so that we can then obtain the structure of our unit group of orders. Okay, so. First, to the reminder part. If you remember, we had Sn, which denoted the space of symmetric matrices, Pn, which was our positive definite quadratic forms modulo the action of GLnz. And just to make that clear again, how does GLnz act? If we've got a tuple of matrices from Sn and GLnz. Let's call them F and G. Then we just send that to G transposed F to G. So then if we now fix a form F in P, then first of all, we denote the application of the quadratic form F in this way. Then what we also define is a minimum um, corresponding or the minimum of that form, which we're, where we're just going to take the minimum of all the values if we, um, if we run with our X through Z to the end where we exclude the zero vector. Then we have the corresponding set of minimal forms, uh, minimal vectors, I'm sorry. And one thing that is going to be important for us, or one of the main things that we're going to compute in the following is the Voronoi domain of F, which includes the linear combinations of the rank um, rank one matrices defined by the minimal vectors of F and with scalars greater than or equal to zero. And another important notion is that of our form F being perfect. And when do we call 
a form as perfect, we do that if and only if um, our or the Voronoi domain of set form spans, and I'm talking about the R span here, um, spans space of symmetric matrices. All right. So, so far, or this is what I wanted to say regarding the notation we've already seen, and three things that we can obtain from applying Voronoi theory are, um, for one, uh, enumeration of perfect forms up to Thiel and Z. Um, what we can also get is a tiling or a tessellation of Pn, which does consist of um, the Voronoi domains of perfect forms. And what we can also get is a corresponding graph where as our vertices, we just take our representatives and we say that two vertices are connected by an edge if um, the two perfect forms are neighbors. What I mean by that, if you don't remember, I'll come to that in a few minutes. Okay, so, so far any questions? Fine. Um, and we didn't. Okay. Okay. So, um, now let's come to the modification I hinted at that we need for our extension case. And I'm not going to talk about the theory behind it, but I'll just mention it so you know what, yeah, what we're working with. Um, if you remember in his talk, Paul Gunnels talked about an extension that is due to Max Kircher. And then um, there's an another extension, basically an extension of that, that um, goes back to we considered basically things we're going to be in and our sort of analogon to Pn is going to be one of the cones. Uh, it's going to be both cones since it's going to be self-dual, but yeah. So, attention to take different colors since we're basically going to make a few minute changes. But before we can do that, we need to extend the knowledge we have of the situation we're in, or a slightly chip that we have a finite dimensional sum called Q algebra and you might remember that if we have a finite dimensional sum called Q algebra then we also have K askew field so that A is isomorphic to the end by N matrices over K and we're going to now x is c the center k and d squared the c dimension of k and furthermore we're going to um, in the following not going to be considering a directly for the most part but we're going to consider a with um, an extension of scalars to R. So let's know that. Yeah, so we'll denote that as AR and the same thing for K. We're going to know denote as KR. Something we've already seen in the previous talk is the following. Hmm? Following isomorphism or the following um, algebra is isomorphic too. Let's just call this one B. We have a sum of this and 
matrix algebra. And why or how are we going to to use this? Um, or why did I write it down at this point? If you look at the definition of the path, then you can see that one of the basic things we needed was a notion of symmetry. And that is what I'm going to write down or ask on before changing or modifying our notation. So if you look at this side, at B, then you might notice that on each of the summons, we have kind of a natural involution in the case of R that being the, um, the transposing in the case, the case of the Hamiltons um, being quaternionic um, conjugation and transposing the matrix. If you, um, if you don't remember it from oral part talk, um, conjugation in terms of quaternionic algebras basically um, follows the same idea as it does with the complex numbers. We'll, um, we have our four our four generators, one i, j, and i, j. And what we do is send one to itself and all the other generators to their negative counterparts. And again, the same thing, first conjugating, then transposing the matrix. On this side, this gives us, if we combine those, gives us an involution on B, and if we then, then fix an isomorphism here, that also gives us an involution on AR. That doesn't necessarily fix our algebra A, but since we're in the following interested in, um, yeah, in the tessellation on, on kind of this side, that's not going to be the problem for us. So we note the involution we get on AR. Dagger. Then of symmetry again. And we can slightly change this and say that we now that we now oh, sorry that we now call uh, sigma, which is again going to be our symmetric space, but this time we'll be talking of AR. But is going to stay the same. Yeah, we've got a dagger here. So. And now we we also have an analogon in terms of the positive definite forms. We are going to call that one P. And this time we'll have our elements come from sigma. Positive definite uh, positive definite is going to stay the same, but we're going to, at this point, not look at it modulo in operation, but just in and of itself. And what I mean by a positive definite is that all of the summons of RF from AR are positive definite. In the following, we're going to, to see that that basically translates to F defining positive definite quadratic form, but for now it's just the matrices in the summons are positive definite. Then, up, um, starting from here, we're using that our elements f were defining or were in and of themselves quadratic forms. We're going to have, we're going to find Similar again. 
but we'll also need to pick some more spaces. First of all, let V be the vector space dimension n over k and VR again the extension of scalars or V with extension of scalars and what we're also going to define is a scalar product that is going to go from sigma times sigma to r and what we do is pretty much the same as what we've seen before um, we are going to send two forms let's call them f1 and f2 the reduced trace of f1 times f2 or to give us of our elements in sigma as it forms on vr in the following way this time we define f of x the scalar product rank one may correspond to what we've seen in the original case because this is going to be or this is equal to the trace of the x dagger fx okay so with these notions and after finding the corresponding quadratic forms on vr to our elements going to send on a patient this time as we saw over there we'll have to exchange transpose for a dagger and add the reduced trace and then our minimum is going to basically stay the same we were talking about something discrete here and we're going to need or we're going to do something discrete here in our case again so we'll also We'll also fix a lattice L in B, and we want for that this to be O invariant. Okay, in the following, I'm going L or applying f to elements of v what i mean is applying f to elements of l or v in vr just so that makes sense okay now we're just going to add the lattice where take our vectors for the minimum to be non-zero vectors in that lattice the rest is more or less the same
now that we have Sorry. now that we've fixed our notation let's get to the application part um, what I said is that we are going to um, going to look at or run through an example and see how we obtain a Werner data and then, um, use our unit group O act on the corresponding graph compute the unit group um, and in order for us to be able to do that we actually need one more thing that being the action of our unit group. but that also is going to basically be the same we've had our action of um, G L N V on S N and um, sorry for thinking that. So we're going to be doing basically the same thing. We'll just take G L N K. We'll act on sigma and we'll use Decker. Now let's get to the example. I have to move this the zoom part the zoom panel because I don't really see anything. So that's better. Alright, so we now want to look at an order, compute the Werner data and then after considering the action, finally compute the unit group. And what we want to have first is our finite dimensional simple U algebra A is mainly what you see. I don't know, can you see my um, um, my mouse? Oh, yeah. Right, thank you. So um, that is the part you see from up there to here. So what we've got is a Cartesianic algebra over the rationals. And this I'm going to talk about in a minute, but A and B are what we use to define our Cartesianic algebra. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can do that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Is that better? All right. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so where was I? Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a Cartesianic algebra over Q, and we're going to have it. Well, it's going to. It's defined by those two numbers, a, which is minus one and B, which is 21. Um, I'm sort of running out of space, but it's briefly so of is this Cartesianic algebra, and we're going to have S um, generating set for an algebra. Our generator is I and j i squared is going to be minus 1 and j squared is going to be b so 21 and
and we also want that i times j is the same as minus j times i. I'm going to be talking about i times j is k. <coughs> so we've got those here. And then what the next part is starting with k theta, or actually starting with f, is mainly us um, embedding our questionionic algebra into um, into the matrix algebra over the splitting field that is defined by the poly polynomial f. And what we're going to do is send i to 0, 1, minus 1, 0, and send j to the square root of 21, 0, 0, and minus and the square root of 21. That's, what, that's what's happening there. And in this part here tells us what the um, order we're going to be considering looks like. So we've got as our first generator 1, and then as the second one, one plus uh, one half plus one half times j, then the third generator is k, including this one here, and the last one is going to be one half times i plus one half times k. All right, and this is just writing that in terms of matrices. What we now want, if um, if you recall to, in the end, have our complete Voronoi data, is to first find a first perfect form. And what we can use to do that is the following theorem that guarantees that we can find one and it also gives us a way of doing that. Um, you can find that in the more general form in the paper by Jürgen Abgenau regarding this, um, this extension of Voronoi theory. And you can also find it in the paper specifying this, yeah, this method in general um, for computing unit groups of orders. That goes back to um, Benoit Prangeau, Gabriel Lemebe, Sebastian Schoenbeck, and Oliver Brandt. And what we basically have is that we take if we take any form in our positive cone that if, i mean if it's already perfect then we're done but if it's not then we can find um, a form outside of the cone that is going to be orthogonal to all of its um, all of the forms minimal vectors and that if we find a suitable scalar to kindly translate it with, um, it's going to give us a Voronoi, uh, a mu form that for one um, um, means that it holds that the um, dimension of the new Voronoi domain is strictly greater than the one of the one we started with. and that our original minimal vectors are included in the new one. The second part here is what guarantees for us to find a first perfect form because if we iterati iteratively um, increase the dimension, we can only go so far since it's, since, it's, um, since it's finite, then at some point we're going to have found a perfect form. And actually, that is the part I wanted to say. If you recall, in basic data, we had this um, this number dim sum. That was just the dimension of our symmetric space because we're going to use um, the dimension to check whether a form we found is actually perfect or not. So let's find our first. First of all, 
So let's give MapMy the information that it needs. And in our case, it's just two. And now let's pick the first form we start with. It doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. I'm not actually as ambitious as, as wanting to find one directly myself. So I'll just start with the first one that I know of being in our symmetric space or actually just what we'll now do is starting with that with that form ask for our first perfect form we found one which is good it looks that way what we now want is to find representatives of perfect forms modulo our um, our action of the unit group which lies in GLNK and what we do for that if, is if you recall we look at all the neighbors of the form that we've already found check whether they give us new perfect forms and if so we add them to the pile sort of of still to check forms and if not then we'll just yeah, we'll just not consider them further and if we do that after finitely many steps since we all only have finitely many um, representatives we'll get all of our representatives and basically the same idea we'll find an orthogonal orthogonal form that we're going to use to translate our starting point which in this case is going to be a perfect form and what's good about this one or what's yeah what's nice is that we actually have a concrete description of how our scalar should look like we still need it but this is a concrete description of what it should look like another um, another thing that holds for um, for perfect forms we find that way is that our minimum is going to be fixed which is um, part of part of how this works um, or which results from how it works um, and so we first compute a minimum to to tell the function what we're going to be starting with. Then we need a bunch of Rono data. Which we're going to get to later. And now let's get to the good stuff. Because now we're going to be computing our the Voronoi domains and our tessellation at least modulo our unit group and the corresponding graph so we start with the first form we found and what we see now is that the domain of our first form has three faces and three corresponding perfect forms two of which are new I suppose you don't necessarily need this anymore, so just so let's see what it looks like. I've actually had um, my computer draw it, but since I'm now on the blackboard and my drawings skills are admittedly um, limited, I hope you will 
grant me some sort of artistic freedom while drawing this. We started with our first, first perfect form, and its Voronoi domain looks something like this. And what we can see is, I mean, you can maybe already guess it, which one is going to not be a new representative. It's this one here in the middle, the second one that is going to have representative once again. So we find a one here. And the first one is new, so let's call that one too, since it's the second representative. The, the third one is new as well, let's call that three. And let's continue with our second representative. All right, so here again, we have three faces, three corresponding perfect neighbors. One, only one of them is new and we add that new one to our to-do list. And since I'm running short of time, I'll, or short on time, I'll just draw the rest so that we can get to our unit group faster. All right, so. Our second one has two neighbors, which we're going to call four, and there's going to be a three again. Then our third representative, again, has two neighbors, none of which is new. And they're going to be four and two. Then our fourth representative also has those three neighbors, and one of them is going to be new. That one's five. Over here. It's slightly crooked, I'm sorry. Um, and then basically the ones we also need, which we won't get just from running through the representatives, but that I computed as well, are one here, then two, three, five. One, four, and one. Okay. So this probably looks familiar because we've already seen Voronoi domains and Voronoi complexes. And what we're going to be concerned concerned with is the resulting graph. This time, not the graph of representatives. The graph where, where the vertices include all of perfect forms of a fixed minimum, in our case of minimum two, and we'll have the forms as our vertices, and the neighboring relation is what gives us our edges. And so on. Now we've got our unit group acting on sigma. What we also have is that it acts on P. Why is that? Why does it leave positive symmetric forms positive symmetric? That's basically because of um, this equation here. Because we run over the same vector still since our left is was taken to be O invariant then what we now have too is that we leave perfect forms perfect and the minimum is going to stay the same second one again being because of this equation and our um, yeah keeping the perfection rank so to speak or keeping the perfection is because of this one our Voronoi domains are going to span a space of the same dimension 
what we now still need is that we send edges to edges and that is mainly going to be because of this equation if we um, if we consider what our edges consist of our edges correspond to shared co-dimension one faces of the Voronoi domains and if we look at the vectors um, yeah, if we look at what they span, again, we'll basically only get a multiplication with an invertible element. So we'll send co-dimension one faces that are shared to shared co-dimension one faces, and we'll act on our graph. Um, I'll just write down the generators we get when applying Bastier structure theorem to the theorem to that, and that's going to be the stabilizers of our representatives of perfect forms. And what we'll also get as generators are um, our, um, our elements of G that send the neighbors of perfect forms, for example, this one here, which is a neighbor of our representative one, to the representative we fix. Um, so, in the last well, few minutes, let me talk very briefly of the presentation we can also get if we um, extend the way we use bus Zer theory that was done by uh, Brown, and he extended that to to CV complexes or two skeletons of CV, CV complex, uh, CW, I'm sorry, CW complexes. Um, and that led to a possibility of describing presentations of groups acting on those in a certain way. And I just want to show you one of the main types of relations, so to speak, that we get. So we just computed the generators I briefly talked about and now what we'll do is compute the present. Leave that for now, and I'll just briefly show it in our graph. So mainly, what we do is we we choose a co-dimension two passive or to put two, a co-dimension two face, and we mainly run around that co-dimension two face. Let's say we start with of form one, then we go to two next. See that this is already a representative. We'll continue to three. We'll look at the um, the element that sends 
this one to the representative, four, three. We'll remember that one, four, one, two, four. And then see that if we look at the first one we got, the first, the first element that sent three to its representative is going to send four to this one. Then look at the element that sends four to the representative on four. Multiply, multiply that to the first element we remembered and go on like that. And in the end, we'll end up again at one and get an element that sends one to itself that isn't just the identity. Um, and that is going on. And that is going to give us an element that lies in the stabilizer of one. And if you recall, we have stabilized elements as well as those, those vectors that send neighbors to representatives in our generator set. And that's how we get one of the main relations in the presentation. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you.